All right. Well, good morning. If you want to, you can go ahead and turn to the book of Romans. That's where I'm going to start. And uh, I don't have anything funny, silly, or none of that stuff to say, so we're going to cut that out. That's good. It's about time. Let's see, I couldn't do it, could I? My goodness. Romans, that's where we're going to be. Um, I, as you're turning, I do want to say uh, thank you to you guys that, for coming up here. And, and Melissa, thank you. Y'all have no idea uh, what all she's done to help. And I, I really, really, really appreciate it. And um, All right. So, so I'm in um, uh, chapter 12, if you want to go there, it's right after 11. Page 1825. Sorry. I can't do it, can I? That's it. No more. No more laughing. It's all serious now. All right, so let's all, let's all stand as we read this. I'm going to start. We're just going to read three verses. That's all I got. It's at uh, Romans chapter 12. We're going to read the first three, and, and I know we've heard this before. So let's pray uh, before. Lord, Lord God, I, I just pray that as we read this, your word, your scripture, Lord God, I pray you, you speak to us through this and, and, and open our minds and open our hearts that we can hear a word from you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so starting in verse 1 in chapter 12, says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the Grace given unto me that every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Thank you. you may be seated. All right, so um, I've got a, uh, let me pull my phone out. That's going to be important because this is like the end of a, okay, I'm good. Wave your hands if I get going long, please. Because um, this is like a, the third part of a sort of a three-part little series thing that we've been doing with the youth. And the last time I talked for an hour and couldn't stop. I just kept going. And, and they were patient and they just listened to me and let me just go on and on and on. <laughs> They'll tell me today. Thank you. All right. Um, so we, um, we, we were actually um, in the book of... I say I mess this name up every time. Haggai. I've always, since I was a kid, I always said Haggai. And I'm like, you know what? I'm pretty sure it's Haggai. Because Haggai is like, hey, you in the back. That, that's not it. Anyway, <laughs> Haggai. So, so it's, um, anyway, this, this is real quick. Uh, and, and it is, I, I would suggest you guys read that. It's only two chapters. You can read that pretty, pretty easy. And, and don't just read it, like study it and see what God has to say out, out of it. But um, one of the things that we've been talking about is, um, is how, ab about the condition of the world and our nation and what's going on. And, and we whine and complain about that a lot. And you've heard this. But we don't, we, this, our church, the church in America, Acts like it doesn't take any responsibility, like it's everybody else's fault, but it's not, it's not ours. But um, we, we read a passage here in chapter 2. This was the last time we met and we did our thing. This, so we're going to continue on with this. So I'm just going to remind you guys and catch the rest of you guys up with where we're at. So it says in Haggai, chapter 2, starting at verse 11. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, ask now the priests concerning the law. He's talking to Haggai and saying, this is what I want you to ask these priests. If one bears holy flesh in the skirt of his garment and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, no. He's like, if I take, take some meat that's been set aside as holy and it touches something else, does it become holy? And the priests are like, no, of course not. All right. He's like, okay, good. And then verse 13 says, then Haggai said, then Haggai, um, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these that means you touch the corpse you're, you're you're unclean if you touch some of those shall it be unclean and the priest answered and said um, it shall be unclean For 14 then answered Haggai and said 
So is this people, this is the, the biblical truth coming out of this thing, right? So is this people and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord. And so is every work of their hands and that which they offer there is unclean. Here's what he's saying. If you touch something contaminated, you become contaminated. It doesn't matter if you're doing something for God. If you've been contaminated, you're contaminating everybody else. And here's the problem. Real quick summary before I get into this Romans thing and that thing over there. I know you're curious about it. And what in the world's going on? Those little things keep falling apart. We'll fix it. So here's, here's the problem. We're contaminated. We don't think we are. We're, we have been contaminated by this world and it's just been sort of a slow erosion thing. It's not like we want to be contaminated. We don't even realize it. We're contaminated by the things that we watch, by the things that you see on television, the things that you read, the things that you hear, the conversations that you have with the whole world. You're being contaminated and you don't even realize it. And I'm going to tell you, I didn't realize it. I had no, I, it, I, was, I was shocked till, till we spent that little time up, up on Murdy Road and we had no television. And then, um, and then I saw TV after about nine months. I had no TV. I didn't see it. And, and I was shocked at the stuff that I had been watching. And then all of a sudden, and I just let it, just like, oh, it's not a big deal. That's just, that's normal. That's just the way it is. But it's not. Get away, step away from that stuff for a while and then look and see what happens. And you, and you see, how about the journal sometimes? Just how many times you see death? How many times does somebody, we so devalue human life in this nation, we don't care anymore. The, 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 we, we, we see it all the time. Somebody gets shot on TV, like, yeah, it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's not real. It's just, it, it is real. Yes, it is. It's, it's affecting your mind. It's what it's doing. And we're becoming contaminated. And then we go out and do something for God. We're contaminating the whole world. So what's wrong with the country? What's going on? We've contaminated it. It's our fault. We're the ones that's got to get right with God. And we're the ones that's got to get this stuff out of our minds and stop acting like the whole world. Like Romans said, stop conforming to the world. Just because they do it, that don't mean we're, we're supposed to be different. We're not supposed to be like that. I read a book that was by Michael Brown, and it's called Saving a Sick America. And he gives a, a little quick scenario in the first chapter about this, uh, this guy who, who has, he just kind of paints a picture of a family in 1961. They're in Pennsylvania. They live in a nice little area, and, and uh, he's got, uh, I think, three kids, three boys and a girl, I think. Anyway, they're, they're, uh, he comes home from work and just normal, you know, describing what's going on. And, and they sit down for TV night and they're watching Leave it to Beaver and they think nothing like it's just normal. That's just the way things are. It just, I mean, go back in your mind, some of you. I know you remember that time. You can go back. And I'm not, I'm not here trying to wor worship the past and saying, remember the good old days. I'm not, I'm not about that. I'm saying, l l let's think about how far we've come in this country. So, so in this story, there he is, they're watching that show and they're thinking nothing about it. And then he falls asleep and he wakes up and he's now, he's in, he's in this time. His TV is much bigger. It's in color and he's got crazy stuff going on TV. Just flip through and just start seeing all the, in, the insane stuff that you see that your mind takes in just on regular television. Even the commercials are just ridiculous and, and they're getting back. But the, the leap to go from there to here, and then he goes on and explains, he, he sees his, his, one of his oldest boys playing uh, uh, a video game. It's one of them violent games and, 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 and the, the things that his daughter's listening to, the songs that in her room that she's dancing and listening to, and they don't think anything about it. But he, because he went immediately from one time to another time, he saw the changes because we don't notice changes if they happen a little bit at a time. But we notice them if they happen drastically, right? If it's a slow erosion, just a little bit and a little bit. And that's what's going on, I think. Um, so I, I actually, um, I, I, I read, a, uh, I was looking on a website. It's called the American Humanist Association. It's an atheist group. And because I want to know, I, I talked to uh, several atheists and I, I you know, I, speak with them and, and uh, I want to know what they believe and they certainly know how I believe and 
So, so I was looking at, at this, and um, uh, he, here's their, if you go there, American Humanist Association, um, it says, this is their slogan. This is what they got on their big webpage. It says, good without a God. So, so they, want their, they think that we can be good. We don't need God. That's their mindset, and that's what they're thinking. And I will tell you, I think that a lot of that came from the church in America that's saying, you just need to be a good person. You just need to be good and act like you're a good person. Come to church every Sunday, every once in a while, if you feel like it. And that's a pretty much what you need to do. Don't, be, don't disrupt everybody. Be, be what society thinks is a good person, dress decent, just be a good person, and that's okay. And that's the mindset that our church is putting out there. So then this atheist group is looking at the church and saying, well, how are you different than me? All I'm saying, because that's what our church, a lot of people, a lot of people that call themselves Christians that I've talked to have said, it's about being good. I've even had Christians tell me that they'll stand before God and say, well, my good outweighs my bad. So it's about what they're doing and about them being good. And it's not about that at all. And not at all. So, so what's different with, with, a, with a mindset, a person who calls himself a Christian, what's different from that mindset from an atheist who's saying, you just got to be good. You just don't need God because there's a lot of church people that say, I don't need God. I can be good on my own. Um, there's uh, 236 uh, of these groups that have, I guess you'd call them, Atheist churches, I don't know what they would sing, but say, got a joke in there. But anyway, so there's like 200, around the nation there's 236. California and Florida have the most. They have the largest number. The third uh, state, the state that has the third most, North Carolina. We got a bunch of them. Um, and I was looking, there's some in uh, Hickory, Morganton, a couple of them in Morganton, Charlotte, Asheville. Concord, there's, there's several of these and they're, they're growing pretty fast. And, uh, and, but that's the idea that we as a church are sending out there. You just got to be a good person. You just got to be good. Um, and that's it. So anyway, so let me, let me go on with this little thing right here and kind of explain it. Um, it it's, uh, I, you guys know my background, the, the, the science stuff. And I want you to understand this. I want to say this before we even start. I'm, I'm not... I'm, I'm going to show you, I was, I was looking at the, the passage where Jesus said that um, in Matthew 5, 13, says, you're the salt of the world. And it just so happened, I've heard that my whole life. And I just hear, yeah, yeah, I get it. Preserve. I know. I, know, I got that. Flavors. We got it. But I don't really think about it, what it means. And it just happened that I was studying and teaching uh, in chemistry. We were studying the formation of ionic bonds. It just kind of hit me. And I'm not saying this is some revelation that God has given me because everything I need to know is right here. I don't, I don't need anything else. I don't, I don't need all these signs and things like that to point and show me who God is. I'm just saying it's pretty cool. It's kind of like, um, I, I like, Melissa, I like looking at your paintings. And, and it's, I, I would rather look at Melissa's paintings than Picasso. I don't know Picasso. I, I don't know these other paintings, but I know her. And, and, and when I look at it, it's not that I know more about her. I appreciate her paintings because I have a relationship and I have a friendship and I know her and I can appreciate her paintings. So when I look at God's creation through science or whatever it is I'm looking at, it's not that I'm getting some revelation and I'm understanding who God is. It's that I appreciate it because I know the guy that created it. I, I have a relationship with him so that I can appreciate it. And that, I, that's it. So do, when you look at this, don't say, well, see, that proves God because it does. That's, this is not what I'm looking at. I'm just saying... This is kind of cool because, I don't know, I just saw this and it's kind of neat. So if you guys that are going to help me with this, if y'all want to come on up here, we're, we're going we're gonna to do this. So, so as they come up here, we're going to look at the formation of salt. Oh, th this week I was bored because we had a two-hour delay and teachers have to go in early on time. So I took some uh, uh, sodium bicarbonate and hydrochloric acid. If you ever run out of salt in your house... And I did a little lab mixture in there, and I, I burned off the excess hydrochloric acid in the water, and I made pure salt, just pure salt. Sprinkle it on your potatoes and stuff. Got a little extra hydrochloric acid laying around. <laughs> you guys are doing great. Don't worry if those little electrons are falling off. See, we're not God. We can't make those things anyway. 
God put them together, they don't come apart. I don't trust these atoms anyway. Y'all know atoms make up everything. <laughs> good enough. It's good enough. You're, you're doing great. That's perfect. It's going to be quick anyway. So as I was looking at this, I'm going to walk over here. I, I got a mic. I can move. So here's what I'm going to look at. Um, here's ha what happens in the formation of salt, sodium chloride. So you have so sodium here that has a valence electron. It's, it's a little valence electron spinning around here. And then you've got chlorine that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's a thing in chemistry called the octet rule where they need eight to be full, blah, 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 whatever. They want to, want to have a full valence shell. So this valence electron, here's what, here's what happens in this. Red with the arrow. Hold it up high. Check this out. This goes woo, over here. Electrons are negative, by the way. They have a negative charge. It goes over here, and it sticks. We'll, we'll say right there. It's good. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now it has eight. It's, everything's good. So what happens since this sodium lost an electron, which is negative, now it has more positives. So sodium is positive. Chlorine, it just gained a negative. It becomes negative. Miranda's heard all this because she sat through my class. So this becomes negative. So, so we got a positive ion and we got a negative ion. And then here's what happens. We all know opposite charges attract. So the positive, the negative, bloop, 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 stuck. There you go, salt. We just made salt. Yay, salt. Now hold on right there. Keep, keep that back, back up just a little bit. Let's go back. It wasn't that great. So let me, let me show you something. This is what I got to thinking about. When I saw that, and it just hit me, God's like, hey, look, that's pretty cool, right? And I was like, yeah, that is pretty cool. He's like, yay. Um, <laughs> that's how me and God talk. So um, here's what I noticed. In order for, uh, so first of all, since we said this was positive, let's say that this is, uh, this is God. It's positive, right? We'll say God's positive. This is not an attitude thing. This is an, a, a, a charge, but we'll just say that's positive. We'll call that God. And this is negative, chlorine. And, and since generally we, we, we can agree that we're negative a lot, we'll, we'll just call this negative us. There's God. There's us. Okay. So first of all, to be salt, to be salt, you better not go out on your own. Whatever it is you do, don't be salt on your own. Don't go off on your own. You, you're not going to be effective. As a matter of fact, chlorine, which we said was us, right? Chlorine is uh, by itself is, is a deadly gas. Spread chlorine around the world and it's going to kill things. If we think we can go out on the world and, and be effective on our own, we're deceiving ourselves because we're, we're just destroying the world. And that's what's happening, I think. It, it, we're, we're not going in with the power of God. But if we're bonded with God, you want to be salt, you better be bonded with God. There be, the, God better be in that or, or it's, it's, it's not just going to be useless. It's going to be deadly is what it's going to be. So, so here's what I got. Watch this. You ready? In order, some of y'all are going to catch on real fast, even though I, you, I just watch. In order for sodium to become an ion, it has to sacrifice something. Who do we say this was? Okay, you remember that. Sodium's got to sacrifice something. Something's got to go. Something has to be sacrificed. It's its only Valence electron. It's the only one it's got. And it's going to sacrifice and get rid of it. Chlorine over here has a spot. It's got like a hole. It's got a gap, a place that it needs. It needs that. And the only thing, all of the chemistry, the only thing that it's going to take is this. That's it. This sacrifice is something, and that's got to take it. So there's a sacrifice, and, there, there's, and you got to receive it. But also, check this out. Chlorine gas... Is, a, is what's called a diatomic. You remember that? Just say yes. It's a diatomic, which means it cannot bond. It can't be alone. It's got to bond. If it's, if it's pure chlorine gas, it's going to bond with itself. Good point right here. Listen, chlorine gas, in order to, to bond with salt, it has to turn away from itself, and it's got to bond with this. It has to. All right, you guys can sit down. Thank you. Y'all did so awesome. You're good. Y'all are, are good. I hope that didn't take too awful long. Gosh. Okay, so, so just, just think about those as we go through. Um, that, that, 
we, we have to turn from ourselves. So, so let's go through that. Jesus said, be salt. So here's the things. There's got to be a sacrifice. There's got to be a repentance. And there's got to be a reconciliation. So I, I kind of want to look at those in a reverse order this, this morning real quick. So we're going to do the reconcile part. I'm talking about that. And then the repentance, the reconciliation, that's, that's the bond that God gives us. And then the, the repentance, that's the, the decision that, that we make. And then the, the rescue, I wrote it as the rescue. That's the sacrifice that was made. So let's start with the bond, reconciled. Um, this, is what, this is what we need as a church, as, as the need to be that the church has called us to be. He's called us to be salt. He's called us to, to bond. By the way, ionic bond is a super, super strong bond. What, what do you think about the bond is between you and God? If God's got a hold of you, that's a strong bond, right? Ionic bond's a really strong bond. Chemistry is the strongest bond. So it's a very strong bond. So on our own, we're destructive and we can't be effective and we can't be the salt that we're supposed to be. So we have to be reconciled. We have to be partnered up with God. We have to. Don't even think about going through this life and thinking that you're going to do anything effective for God or anything effective for this church or this nation or anything if, you, if you're not partnered up with God. So, so the first thing is the bond or be reconciled. The second part is the repent. This is the tough one right here. It's the, the decision. This is where we miss it a lot. We have to turn from ourselves toward God. I heard somebody say, now, y'all listen carefully to me when I say this. Somebody's going to get their feelings hurt. I certainly did. As I was writing this, it's killing me as I was writing this stuff. I was like, really, God, how am I going to say? Because some people are going to get your feelings hurt. But I'll say I heard somebody say that um, the best thing we could do for church, this, for the church in America, is to get rid of Sunday morning worship service because it's the biggest time of idol worship that Christians do. Because we come and worship the God that we created in our mind. We, we, we worship a God that says, if I just show up, if I just am a good person, if I, if, when that chlorine, I'm going to keep referring to it, when that chlorine bonded with that sodium, did, do y'all know that the, the whole thing bonds with it? Not just part of it. It didn't just give a little bit of it. And it doesn't just say, well, I'll bond a little bit and then I, when I decide to. He gave everything. Listen to this again. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice. What's a living sacrifice? What do we sacrifice? He's talking about giving up. You've got to say, you know what? I, I, I'm going to be a sacrifice. I give my whole self to God. Repenting does not mean that I just, I'll just worship a little bit. I heard somebody, I'm going to skip over because I heard, I heard a, a, listen to this. A.W. Tozer quoted this. It says, if you will not worship God seven days a week, you do not worship him one day a week. Who? Is that all we do? We just give him part of our life? And that's idol worship when we say, God's not going to require me to do that. That's being a fanatical. God's asking way too much. And you see there's problems in this nation and we as a church act just like everybody else, and we're like, ah, it's too much. If the weather's bad, we don't want to, that's, that's too much of a sacrifice. Or if there's something else going on, that's too much of, there's a tournament going on. I got to take my kids here, and I got to do that. Guys, I'm going to take, parents, if you're doing that to your kids, I'm going to tell you something. You, you're pushing them away from God, and you're making them act just like the rest of the world. And you're okay with that? And they're going to grow up being just like you. They're going to grow up saying, I don't need to give my whole self to God. And guys, it's time we stop this messing around and stop playing. We spend so much time on silly little games and the little Facebook stuff and taking pictures of ourself and sending them out to everybody because we are so obsessed with ourself. We, we, we want the whole world, we, we're all about self-publication. We want, we want the whole world to see us and see what we're doing. And guys, we got to stop that. You got to understand that's what the world does because they're so in love with themselves. Can I read this quote to you again? American Humanist Association, a good without a God. They don't need a God to be good in the eyes of society. Sure, yeah, but they don't understand. You were born into evil. There's no way you can do this on your own. There's no way you can be a good. You can't stand beside of a righteous, holy God and say, 
I was pretty good, God. No, it's not good enough. And you can't act just like, you can't call yourself a Christian. You can't call yourself a church. And all you're doing is playing silly little games and, and wasting your life away. Wasting it. For what? All the stuff that you do is going to burn up when you stand before God. All the things that you sent your kids to and made them go do because you pushed them because you want them to have all these activities is going to burn up. And it's going to be gone. All right. So there needs to be a repentance. There needs to be evidence of a change in your life. You know, I've thought about this before and I thought, well, I don't remember having a change. I don't, I don't look any different. I don't act any different. I remember uh, one of my daughters told me, she said, now y'all listen, this is what she said. When she was young, she was like seventh grade, middle school. I don't know. She said, um, I wish I was hooked on drugs so that I would have a good testimony. Right? You've seen those people that come up here and say, oh, I just been, it's been so bad. And, and, and there's a lot of people that's gone through that. But how about this testimony? That I, I was with God my whole life. And I didn't go out and do the things that, I, that everybody else was doing. I did, what kind of testimony is that? That's what we need to be thinking about. But, but, but here's the thing. It, it, and I've thought about that. Well, I don't remember. I mean, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't a mean person. I was sneaky mean, I guess. I don't know. I did get in trouble a lot. But it wasn't bad. I didn't think I was bad. I mean, I didn't do violent crimes, I guess. No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. It was just little things in school that should not do. But, but I wasn't a mean. I, I don't think I was a mean person. And I, I'm like, I don't, because I'm still sneaky. I still do things. I can't help. But, um, so I don't see a drastic change there, but, and I always thought about that. But yes, there was a change because my mind has been changed. And, and what's on my mind is consumed with things of God. W what am I going to do every single day? When I'm at school, I'm thinking about what I need to do with God. Guys, I'm telling you, I, I talk to, and I know y'all have seen me talk to students and, and teachers, and I'll grab the janitor, I'll grab anybody who can. I don't care who it is. Somebody's going to listen to me because I'm going to talk to them. And they know they won't come talk. They come talk to me because because I'm not I, I'm not going to not talk about my faith because that's who I am. Let me let me ask you this: What if I said we just all experienced a tornado? Right? Y'all know what happened? What, did y'all know? Somebody asked. Me, somebody told me that this week at school. They said, "Hey, Coach Collins, do you, do you know we had a tornado? <laughs> really? We was out two days. I had no idea while we were out. <laughs> He's just letting me know. This is a smart student too." Yeah, this is one of the this is one of the brightest chemistry. Yeah, this is a bright student, <laughs> letting me know we had a tornado. So so uh, so anyway, what if I showed up late, and I just showed up 11:30. I just showed up late, looking kind of like this, hair decently combed and and wrinkled free. Um, so what if I showed up and I said, yeah, on my way. The reason I was late was because as I was coming to church, um, my jeep messed up, and I and I stopped to get out. And then a tornado hit my Jeep and it, and it threw my Jeep up against a tree and picked me up and I like got drug across and, and I'm like swirling around with the tree and threw me through one hole and you know, I mean, y'all seen the destruction that's going on and stuff. And, yeah, and that's what happened and whew, I just made it and I just got here. And you're gonna look at me and say, you're insane. That's insanity. There's no way. I, I would be, you, you, you could tell straight, you, you could tell immediately that I'm lying. That, that's not a true story. By the way I look, you, you can't, I cannot encounter a tornado and not come out looking different. Now, I know we don't have a whole lot of tornadoes. Now, I grew up in Mississippi, and it's kind of regular, big tornado. I mean, I'm talking about tornadoes that come through, and half the town is gone. Not like a hole in the roof. I'm talking about there's nothing there. I remember it was an A&P grocery store that was completely gone. There wasn't nothing there. Wasn't even groceries wasn't even there. I don't know where they went, but there was just a big giant slab where this big giant grocery store used to be. But that was kind of, hmm, that's kind of common. It's not like, oh, it's a big deal. Stuff didn't even make the news. Yeah, store's gone. Yeah, big deal. They'll build it and a couple of years later, it'll be gone again. That's just what happened. It, there's, it's kind of common, but you can't experience a tornado. And <laughs> my timekeeper, <laughs> you can't experience a tornado and come out the same. You can't experience. You can't encounter a holy God and come out unchanged. All right. So the last thing, the sacrifice, the rescue. 
Um, to be effective as salt, you need to be reconciled with God. That's the bond. To be reconciled with God, you need to repent. That means you got to stop playing around and stop doing like everybody else. Stop hanging around with yourself and, and the God that you've created and turn to God. And to be able to repent, you have to be rescued. There has to be a sacrifice. So I heard somebody say, ask this question, how can one man's death on a cross 2,000 years ago atone and cover all the sins of all humanity, a countless number of people? How is that? How can one person cover everybody's sin? And here's the reason. Because that one person is worth more than all the rest of us put together. And we forget that sometimes because we don't want to look at what Jesus has done and we don't understand it. In Matthew, I'm not going to read it to you, but I know you're familiar with this. In Matthew 26, it's in the other Gospels too, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and he's sweating drops of blood. And he says to God as he's praying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And then he says, Never, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. And, he's, and he prayed it again. And then he prayed it again. And he's, and, he's, and he's in agony. And I've heard people say, Jesus was afraid to go to the cross. And Jesus was, af was afraid. And I've heard people talk about how bad he was beaten. Come on. Jesus was not afraid. How many of the disciples got chicken and ran when he got arrested and then they themselves were put to death? Do you think that their leader was afraid after they so boldly went to their death? But their leader was, nah, he wasn't afraid. That's not what he was afraid. What was in the cup, guys? What was in the cup? That, what was it that Jesus had to drink? Let me, let me tell you, you understand this. Because here's what we do. We trivialize the cross to where it means nothing and we just put it on a little bumper sticker or we just wear it as a little piece of jewelry and we don't even really understand what it is and we don't understand the sacrifice. And until you can understand the sacrifice that God made, it doesn't make sense to you. But when you understand it, then you willingly can give your life to God. All of it, not a piece of it, not just a little bit on Sunday mornings, but all of it. And everything you do can be about him. But here's what was in the cup, the wrath of God, the full unleashed hatred of sin, wrath of God. You think Noah's ark was bad when he was sending down and he spared something. So that wasn't the full wrath of God. This was it. This was all of it. His hatred for all sin of all of, of, all of mankind, everything that we've done. You think God does not hate sin. He poured out every bit of his wrath. That was what was in the cup. And here's the thing, Jesus drank all of it, all of it, so that when he was on the cross and when he said it's finished, there wasn't a drop left in the cup. God's full wrath, that's what he took on. And that's what we need to understand. And that's where we, we miss sometimes, but he drank it all. When you understand that, when you understand the cross, that's when you'll give your life to him. And it's not going to be just some little bitty trinket that you've seen. He's everything or he's nothing. We've got so many idols, even the God that we created, the God that we wanted, that Jesus is not even first, he's not second, he's not even third in our life. I read a quote from a guy named Abraham Kuyper, and it says, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. It's all his. It was all his to begin with, all of it. It's all his. What, what do we think we're doing? What do we spend our whole life getting something that's not even ours? That life that you have is not yours. But we want everything for ourselves, and it's all his. It's all his. Jesus, it, listen, he is not some flu shot that you get a shot, and you're like, oh, I'm good. Yeah, I said a little, I said something, I said a little prayer, I'm good. I took my flu shot. That's not what it is. Give your life to him. That's what he's wanting. Turn your life to him. If, um, 
If everyone, in the, if everyone on this planet were blind, it would not diminish the sun and the moon and the stars. They'd still shine. If everyone on this planet were atheists, it's not going to diminish God. God's still God. It's not going to diminish the glory of God. Do y'all realize that Satan and a third of the angels fell and God sent no Savior? And if God did not send us a Savior when we fail, he's still good and he's still fair and he's still God. But we get so caught up in ourselves that we don't want to turn from ourselves and we won't, don't want to turn toward God. That's it. I'm going to offer an invitation. Where's our singing? And we're going to, Melissa's going to sing. Guys, let's stand. Melissa's going to, are you going to lead us? And we're going to sing together. You're just going to sing. Well, let's stand. Melissa's going to sing. I want you guys to think about this, this as we're singing. If there's anything in your life that think that, 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 I've pushed God out. Guys, I'm telling you, you, you want to you be saved, you want to have that right relationship with God, then you better seek God. Ask God, God, what do I need to do right now? And don't just say some little sentence or something and think, oh, I'm good, and then go out the, out the doors and live your own life and do what you want to. Let me ask you this as she's getting ready. If I said right now, here's a piece of paper, write down on your piece of paper, what, what, what's your... What's your What's your calling? What's your place in this church? What's your ministry in this church? What are you doing for, the, for God's church? And then on the second part, what have, you done, what have you accomplished this year for this church? And then on the back side, write down, what's your plans? What's your plans for, the rest, for this upcoming year of what you're going to do for this church? I, I, I'm just going to guess and say there's a lot of us in here that would have a blank piece of paper. And what would happen if you did the same thing to your employer and you gave him that and said, I don't plan on doing nothing. I don't plan. I don't have no future. I don't have no, no plan for you. I, I, I'm, but I'm here every time, every time your doors are open, I'm going to be there. But I got, no, I, I got no passion for this. I'm not going to do anything to further your business. You're not, it, it, you're not going to last. What, what, if, what if we do the same thing, if we offer the same thing that we offer God? What if we offered that to our spouses or your family just a little bit? I kind of got time for y'all. How, how long does that relationship last? Guys, here's the bottom line. You have to turn from yourselves and you have to turn from God. And you have to understand what that cross means. And you need to get in that word and study in it. And you, you need to pray to God and say, God, help me understand what this means. This is not a joke. This is not some silly little thing that God just said, yeah, just follow these rules. But you understand what God did for you. And then turn to God. Turn from ourselves to God. Melissa, go ahead. So if you need to come down, this is the time you can come on down.